Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. But what do you say at a funeral? Maybe you don't want to go to one or meet the bereaved because you don't know what to say. What do you say after a tragedy? Someone's house is burned down. Or their mother died, they're diagnosed with cancer, a victim of some crime. What would you say to the mothers of those three University of Virginia football players? You know, proud mothers. You know they got to be really proud mothers. Proud that their sons had earned an athletic scholarship at a D1 program and are getting a University of Virginia education. But well, probably for the past couple of years now, telling everyone who will listen, my boy, did you see him? He had so many tackles or receptions or yards. Last Saturday, do you see him on TV? Do you see my boy? And he's and he's on his way to graduate. Do you see him? Only get a call on Tuesday morning. I'm sorry to inform you. What do you say? What do you say when you look into the eyes of someone and they're weeping uncontrollably, wailing in pain, the emotional and the physical so mixed together, they don't know which pain is which, and there's blood everywhere. And a miscarried or stillborn child. And the only thing she can think to say among all the agony and blood and tears is to ask whether the child was a boy or a girl. What do you say? What do you say when you hold someone who is racked in grief and you wish there's something you could do that you'd die a thousand times if you could stop the grief? What do you say? What do you cry out? Isaiah was an old man, his late 60s or around 70, as he stood on the wall of Jerusalem. He's looking out into the rest of Judah, into the countryside, which has been devastated by a marauding, murderous invasion. Almost all the towns and cities of Judah have been obliterated, thousands killed, most mercifully by a quick sword thrust or a jab of the spear, but many others, especially the leading men of towns, impaled on stakes, alive and left like that to die, are literally flailed, their skin ripped off, alive. The Assyrian army had come through, led by Sennacherib, the emperor of the Assyrian Empire, intent on subjugating and just wiping out Judah. Just about 20 years earlier, in 721 B.C., the same empire, the Assyrians, had attacked the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital in Samaria and did just that, destroyed it. The Israelites, they didn't kill. They dragged off to be exiles to other parts of their empire uh, while they brought in other people, pagan people, to repopulate the country. So to the people of Judah in the south, understand Israel at this time has been divided, to Israel in the north, northern kingdom of Israel and Judah in the south. The people of Judah in the south, kind of looking out on all this, like Isaiah on the wall, that was to them what 9-11 is to us. It's a disaster in our memory, a warning of what could happen. And then 20 years later, it did happen. In 701 BC, the Assyrian army came for them this time, going through all the towns and cities of Judah, tearing down walls, burning buildings, raping and butchering people. The second largest city in Judah, 
uh, was Lachish, I believe it's pronounced Lachish, Lachish or Lachish, uh, with a, it had a wall, has fortifications, I would assume an army contingent there to, to defend it, but it did no good against the might of the Assyrian Empire. When it came to walled cities like Lachish, they were, the, the Syrian army was methodical and patient and brutal. They would lay siege to the city so that nothing, no one, no food could get in. Then they would either build an earthen ramp up to, right up to the wall, or tunnel underneath the wall, or both. And they would build siege towers, that just kind of mobile towers, which they would then, when the attack came, wheel up near, near the wall and shoot arrows down in, over the wall and in, down into the city. And then when the big attack came, they would bring battering rams to the gate of the wall. They would come over their ramp, through their tunnels, shooting down their, from their towers, and then kill and destroy, set a fire. They were so proud of how thorough and how vicious their attacks were that they memorialized them in carvings in the walls of their palaces back home in Nineveh. Archaeologists uncovered the memorial to to their destruction of Lachish, which shows them throwing people down from the wall, spears of soldiers, impaled people, flames engulfing the city. You can find it. The archaeologists have it. It's some museum somewhere. You can look it up in Google and see it for yourself. Uh, That was Lachish. Now, imagine if an army, an invading army, had come to America and does that to us. They had done that, say, like, like the series did to Lachish. Some invader did that to Chicago. And now they're heading for Washington, D.C. And there's nothing but a wall. I know there's really no wall around Washington, D.C., but you get my point. Nothing to really slow them down. You're scurrying into the city where you're there for protection because the invaders are killing or capturing and hauling away anyone they can catch in the countryside. But it's just a matter of time before they take the capital city too. So you're huddled in there, hoping for a miracle. And that was the situation they had been in just recently. Sennacherib boasted in his own history. This is another thing historians, it's not in the Bible, it's something historians have uncovered. Sennacherib in his own history wrote about Hezekiah, Judah's king, trapped in Jerusalem. He said, I had Hezekiah, quote, trapped like a bird in a cage. The emissaries of Sennacherib came to Jerusalem, stood outside the wall, and the people of Jerusalem are all standing on the wall, probably Isaiah among them, and listening to these emissaries from, from Sennacherib as they were shouting to the representatives of Hezekiah, Hezekiah's men. When the people standing on the wall listening to this, they, they taunted uh, Jerusalem, Judah, Hezekiah, and they said, thus says the great king. You're, you're, a, you're a minor king. You're a nothing king. The great king, the king of Assyria. Thus he says, you're next. They're all going to starve, all you people in the wall. You're going to starve in the siege. You're going to be so hungry, you'll be eating your own excrement. And they told everyone in Jerusalem listening, you know, don't believe this trust in the Lord stuff. After all, did the gods of those other kingdoms that we destroyed, did they save them? As if the Lord were just another tribal god. And then they had the nerve to claim that the Lord sent them there. In Isaiah chapter 36, verse 10, Sennacherib's men boast, The Lord said to me, go up against this land and take it. They're speaking for the Lord. Hezekiah tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, went to the Lord in the temple, and he prayed. And so the Lord spoke through Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 37, verse 23, Whom have you, Sennacherib, he's speaking to Sennacherib, The Lord is, through Isaiah. Whom have you, Sennacherib, mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. And then in verse 26, the Lord asked Sennacherib, Have you not heard that I, it's the Lord speaking, that I determined it long ago. I planned from days of old what I bring to pass right now. That you should make fortified cities crash into a heap of ruins. In other words, this campaign of destruction. The Lord says, you know, I planned all this. You're my instrument to do my will. Those cities you've destroyed, all the, the cities of the Philistines. They went and they destroyed the cities of the Philistines. Even now, just recently, most recently, Lachish. You did it because I, the Lord speaking, I planned it. And then the Lord concludes in Chapter 37, verse 29, because you have raged against me and your arrogance has come to my ears, I will put a hook in your nose 
and my bit in your mouth. It's kind of the way they treated exiles, captives that they caught in other kingdoms. The Lord say, I'm going to do that to you. And I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And that's what happened. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36 in Second Kings chapter 19 says that an angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And so Sennacherib had to go. An ancient historian Herodotus says that the plague hit them, the bubonic plague. Probably both are true, I would imagine. An angel used biological warfare. So Sennacherib has to go back to Nineveh, where he's eventually assassinated by his own sons. But the people of Judah are shell-shocked. The survivors, now sure, they, they, they made it in Jerusalem, and I I'm assuming they're happy to be alive. They're amazed at God's deliverance. But they knew many of their countrymen who hadn't survived, who were slaughtered, who were impaled, who were flayed, who were brutalized. They had family who had made it, whom they'd never see again. Jerusalem was intact, but the rest of the country was a smoldering wreck. It's kind of like after World War II in China, I would imagine. Sure, some cities, some people survived. But look at Nanking. Everyone has a story in China, I would imagine, after World War II, of some relative machine gunned with the rest of the people from their own village or some relative beheaded by some sentry for simply not bowing low enough. Untold stories of rape. They got a lot of that in Singapore, too. Uh, like that, you're desperately grateful. You know, that I made it. I survived this when it's over. But now you look out on the wake of destruction Stunned. Isaiah stands on the wall of Jerusalem, looking out on burned out buildings, freshly dug graves, the top of walls of other smaller cities. And what's he say? What do you say at a funeral to the mourners, to the parents of three University of Virginia football players? To those wrapped with grief who have lost everything. What do you cry out? We see that here. We see three cries. Notice in verse 2, cry to her. Then in verse 3, a, a voice cries. And then in verse 6, a voice says, cry. What do you cry? First, comfort. Then, prepare. And finally, eternity. What should you cry? Comfort. Comfort. That's what God says in verse 1. It's a command to you, not really to be comforted, but to comfort, comfort, comfort. A specific people, my people, says your God. This is not a time for rebuke, for correction. It's not for, I told you so. If only you people had been corrupt, if you hadn't been unjust to the poor, if you hadn't oppressed the powerless, you wouldn't have got this. If you hadn't had the high places, the altars for unauthorized worship to the Lord. I, I told you, you were only supposed to worship the Lord at the temple according to his word, but you wouldn't listen. And this is what you get. No, it's not a time for that. Not for chiding. Not at this time. The first part of Isaiah from chapters 1 to 35 is full of that kind of rebuke. But after the destruction... This wrecked by the Assyrian army, described in chapters 36 to 39, just before this passage, it's comfort. Comfort. Remember in Ecclesiastes, the time for everything? The wake of tragedy isn't the time for rebuke. Christians sometimes complain that almost everyone is preached into heaven at their funeral, and, and that is a problem. But funerals really aren't places either for condemning the faults of the deceased. Comfort, comfort, especially if they're God's people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem in verse 2. Literally is speak to the heart. That's what the word tenderly there means, to, to, to the heart. The same term is used in the book of Ruth when Ruth first meets Boaz. Remember the story? He's the landowner. He's, he's rich. He's powerful. And she's just a poor woman. She's not even an Israelite. She's an immigrant. From a pagan people who has to pick up the leftovers from other people's harvest. But he says to her, you know, she's on her, she's on his land picking up the leftovers. And he comes up to her and says, listen, my daughter, 
And she might be expecting him to wag her finger. Okay, you have to, I have to let you have to take a little bit. Only, only take what you need. Go somewhere else. Get tomorrow. No, he doesn't do that. He says, listen, my daughter. You don't need to go. You don't need to go to another field. You stay right here. You take whatever you want. And I've told my people not to bother you. I've heard about your, your steadfast love. In Hebrew, your hesed for your mother-in-law. So may the Lord repay you and give you a full reward. And she responded, you have comforted me and spoken kindly. Literally, like here, to my heart. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem, the survivors, the remnant. You might think, well, they're happy to be alive. Well, you wouldn't tell that to the mothers of those three University of Virginia football players, would you? You know, good news, you weren't shot. That would not just be cold comfort, that would be cruel. Here, probably many of the survivors, I would imagine, were, were family of the men. Who, I would imagine some of the men sent their wives, their children to huddle in Jerusalem. And they stayed behind with, in their farms with their animals, hoping that the Assyrians would just pass through and wouldn't bother them. But they were wrong. Others had brothers and sisters and cousins and friends who had been butchered. Even if the whole family had survived, they'd go back out to burned out houses and barns to dead or stolen animals. There's nothing left. What do you say? You speak to the heart of Jerusalem, that remnant, the survivors of the judgment. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, the, the church he says, the, describes the church as the true heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. As we saw in Romans, the wrath of God is being revealed against the world, but God has a, a remnant, he calls them in chapter 9, a band of survivors here, here in Isaiah, in the actual history of Israel, as Jerusalem, the city that survived when everything else was destroyed. The church is that enclave that God has rescued from the judgment that everyone else has suffered. Speak to her heart. Cry to her in the middle of verse 2. Well, what do you say? Her warfare has ended. That destruction that was unleashed, that appeared like it would engulf them too. It, was, it, was, it seemed almost certain they were going to not die not of starvation. They were going to be impaled. They were going to be stabbed. They were going to be brutalized. But no, they have survived and that war is over. Cry to her and say her iniquity is pardoned. The sin that brought this horrible judgment that appeared on the verge of overwhelming them for you has been paid. You don't have to worry about paying it yourself. Now, they did. Those people outside Jerusalem, the people of Lachish, the men out in the farms in the countryside who got beheaded or stabbed or impaled, they weren't pardoned. They had to pay for their own sins. But you don't. The Lord has protected, has pardoned you. Cry at the end of verse 2. That Jerusalem has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. First notice that it is from the Lord's hand. He doesn't try to obscure that, doesn't try to cover that up. You know, where, why did this all happen? If there's a good God and bad things happen, how could that be? He doesn't try to dodge that at all. It is from the Lord's hand, he says. This is not the spirituality of the footprints poem, in which in the hard times of life, you know, he's carrying you, but it doesn't say anything about who's in control of those hard times, by the way. Here Isaiah is looking out on the destruction inflicted on Judah, and he says that they've received it, from the Lord's hand. Remember the Lord told Sennacherib through Isaiah. I planned your campaign of destruction. You're my instrument. As Isaiah looks out on this devastated country. He sees the catastrophe. And he sees it as having come from the Lord's hand. It was his rod that struck them. John Bunyan said. Let us learn like Christians. To kiss the rod. Cry to God's people. You've received double. For your sins. Now, that phrase is a little mysterious. Some think it means that the judgment has been so harsh that it feels like more than they deserve. It was like double the punishment. I, I don't deserve this much. Sure, I deserve something, but not this much. This has been too bad. It's been twice as much as we 
we deserve. That's why they think. Anyway, others point out that the word, which is very rare, means to, to fold over. Like you might fold a sheet of paper. And you double it. And one side perfectly matches the other. Now you have two perfectly matched sheets of paper. So they're saying you've gotten exactly the amount of punishment that your sins deserve. The judgment matches the sin. It's probably both. You'll get matching punishment, but it will feel like double. It's saying that the judgment has been so horrible, but so were your sins. It's comforting here because it's past tense. You have received. It's over. You don't have to worry about any more judgment. It is finished. Now, people today often don't think that pointing to the cross is where the wrath of God was satisfied. They want to point to it as something. This is what I deserve. This shows how much I'm worth. In the Bible, it, it's where the wrath of God is satisfied. But people today often think pointing to the cross for that isn't comforting. And they think that because they don't think they deserve judgment. Judgment comes. The wrath of God is revealed. The wages of sin is death. And they are paying for it. You know, every cemetery, every funeral, their own, our own declining health tells them that the judgment is rampaging through the world. But they don't see it because they think, well, that's just nature. That's kind of all out of God's control. They don't see God's hand in it. And even some pious people, like in the Footprints poem, you know, they want a warm and fuzzy kind of teddy bear God. And so to them, to start to talk like Isaiah here about how he's in control of marauding armies or whatever is causing the hard times, or even worse, to tell them, you know, this is what your sins deserved. You deserve this punishment. And so you either you either take it and receive the, du- the double, the matching amount of punishment for your sins, or someone else does that for you. Now, they say, people today, modern people say, well, that, that isn't comforting. That sounds brutal. That sounds barbaric. That's not comforting. They want to hear how they have no sins, that there is no judgment. And whatever hard times they suffer, it's kind of random. It's out of control. The therapeutic God is, the, is there to carry them through it. You know, the, after all. That's what they pay him for. It's like paying for their insurance. They don't want comfort. They want insurance from judgment. But the Lord offers for his people, for those who confess their sins, who know their need. He cries out. He tells us to cry out. Comfort. Comfort. The war against you is over. You've been pardoned. Your sins are paid for. It is finished. What do you say to someone in distress? To a survivor in so much grief that he or she can only think of what's been lost? Second, a voice cries in verse 3. Prepare. The Lord is coming. What that means to you, that he's coming... That's what the voice is crying, is that you should prepare. Speaking from the point of view of Jerusalem, Isaiah on that wall, looking out at the ravaged countryside, looking out into the wilderness, the rural areas. He sees the Lord is coming. He hears a voice cry out in the wilderness, way out there. Prepare the way of the Lord out in the desert. Make a highway, make it straight for our God. He's coming to you. So make his way easy. This is like the kings in their day. We send out messengers, emissaries in front of them. If they're traveling along, they often call them the king's highway. You can use it if he's not on it, but if he's on it, it's the king's highway. You have to get out of the way. They send out messengers in front. Prepare the way. You know, if there were people camped on the road, if there were shops set up, if there were farmer's markets blocking the way, if caravans were traveling in the opposite direction, move. Because the king is coming. In verse 4, the preparation for the Lord is supernatural. Every valley should be lifted up. Coming to Jerusalem from the east, from Jericho, you know, by the Jordan River, as the Lord Jesus did on his last journey there to, his, to the cross, coming that way from the Jordan Valley, 
then climbs up steeply an ascent of 3,400 feet. And here he's saying, fill that valley in so it's not so low anymore. And the mountains in the way, well, bring them down. Every obstacle to the Lord is removed. Every pothole is filled so it's smooth traveling. It's easy for the Lord to get to his people. Of course, God is not really at all concerned about physical obstacles. He overcomes those easily. What are the real obstacles are the sins of his people. They're seeking first money or pleasure. They're idols. Even idols of good things like relationships or family. The valleys God needs filled are the lack of love, the depressed love for him in his people. Their lukewarmness about worship. That needs to be elevated. The mountains he needs flattened are their idols. The money God. Their pursuit of wealth overall. Their pride. So that they don't think they need pardon. Their ego. That needs to be brought down. But the good thing about this passage, the second cry for verses 3 to 5, is that it's easy to interpret. I didn't have to go very far to find a... Good commentaries on it, because it's already interpreted for us in the New Testament. Every gospel quotes this passage and applies it to John the Baptist. Good commentaries on this passage are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was a voice. John the Baptist was a voice calling out in the desert to the Lord's people. Make straight the way of the Lord. They make straight the Lord's highway by repenting, turning from their sins. So, what do you say? You say what John the Baptist said at, at the right time. There is wrath coming. Flee from it. Repent and show your repentance in good fruit and change lives. Share with the poor. Don't be greedy. Don't live for money. Be content with what you have. Do not trust in your ethnicity. Oh, God will accept me because I was born into this family. I was born into this nation. No, God can make people out of stones. Into your ethnicity, if that's what you think is impressive. And believe in him who was to come. You know, the one who is so great that John said, I'm not worthy to, to tie his shoes. Believe in him, Jesus. In other words, a voice cries, Isaiah says. He's here on the wall. He hears out from that wilderness, the countryside. A voice is crying. Prepare the way for the Lord. How? Repent and believe in Jesus that's how you prepare for the coming of the Lord. Of course, this is written in 701 B.C. And Isaiah is looking forward to the coming of the Lord. We're looking back, but we're looking at the same thing. Still today, the cry is the same. Repent and believe in Jesus. Because it is with him when he came after John the Baptist. The verse 5 was fulfilled. Notice verse 5. The glory of the Lord was revealed. After John, when Jesus came. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The glory of the Lord was revealed and is now revealed in Jesus. We are now in the time that Isaiah is speaking about, from his point of view, as future. We're in that time in verse 5. The glory of the Lord is right now, in our day, in the process of being revealed. And all flesh, all kinds of people will see it together, either now or finally at the final judgment, the end of the age. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. He said it. So it's being done. What do you say to the devastated? Well, verses six to eight tells you a voice says. Cry. Cry what? Isaiah standing on that wall in Jerusalem, 701 B.C., smoldering ruin of a nation in front of him, and a stunned, surviving, but grieving city behind him. And he asked the Lord in verse 6, What shall I cry? What do you say? Turn their eyes... To the eternal. Look at all this. This wreckage of a nation in front of him. Sighs of relief, sure. But also wails of moaning and mourning mixed behind him. What's become of his country? 
this leftovers of a nation. But that's the way life is under the sun. All flesh is grass. And it's beauty. The word their beauty literally is steadfast love. Chesed. The same thing that Boaz recognized in Ruth. I've heard about your chesed. Steadfast love. Here, beauty. The famous important word in the Old Testament. Here, here, beauty. The most beautiful thing that you can have is steadfast love. We're not told what Ruth looked like, but Boaz praises her for the beauty of her character, for her steadfast love. Here, the beauty of the flesh will fade away. It's beauty. Like Jude at its height. With his temple and his towns and his farms. His beauty. Like your money. Your life savings. Your home. Your family. Your body. Whatever it is you think is, is most beautiful. It's like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. The nation gets destroyed. Things fall apart. Bodies decline. Inflation diminishes your savings. Buildings need maintenance and one day have to be demolished. Our bodies age and fade. We try to stay in good health. We eat right. We exercise. We rest. We take our medicine. We get operations and treatments when we need them. But eventually it too is no more. All flesh is grass. And this all happens. The wildflowers fade. He says when, when the breath or the wind or the spirit the same word in Hebrew. It blows on it. It, He withers it all. Just as we saw in Ecclesiastes and Romans. He, He put the creation to bondage, to decay, to vanity. So that we would put our hope in what is eternal. What is over the sun in God. All flesh is grass. Don't put your hope in it. In your family or your marriage or your money or your business or your pension or your health or the government or the doctors or anything under the sun. The spirit of God will blow on it and it will dry up and fade away. What do you say? What do you cry to people? Devastated people who've experienced the fading away. What they thought was the most beautiful. Well, now, after they're devastated, after the beauty has faded away, now they should be able to see it, to hear the news that they wouldn't hear before. Now, before, when they were young and they were determined to succeed, to have the cash, the career, the cars, the house, the business, the relationship, the family, the good times. Well, then they were too full of all that, all the grass, too full of all that to see that it will one day, all that will one day dry up. And blow away like, like grass clippings. You couldn't tell the young woman. Just so full of expectations that this relationship, this will be the one. He will be the one to make me happy. This is the secret to life. That there's more, you couldn't tell her at that time that there's more to life. That gl- the glory comes from elsewhere. You couldn't tell the man determined to succeed. To work every day. Make a success of himself. Give his family all the things they want. He's going to be rich. He's going to be, he's going to have the business. He's going to have it all. You couldn't tell him all through his middle age life to seek first the kingdom of God. He was too busy. He wouldn't slow down long enough to hear it. That to be able to give his child a new car that will one day rust and be a scrap. That that isn't as vital as giving him or her hope and faith in the word of God. James says about this passage, James commenting on this passage, the the rich will pass away like a wildflower for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits, in the midst of his pursuits. They wouldn't listen when they were in the midst of their pursuits When they were chasing the dollars or chasing the relationships, chasing the good times. They wouldn't listen then. But then one day, there's a catastrophe. The phone call. Sorry to inform you. The diagnosis. 
or they just get old and everything has faded away. The child you thought you were earning all that money for doesn't care. Maybe he cares about the money, but not about you. And what do you have? A voice says, cry to them. They need to hear the word of God. This stands forever. The word of our God. It stands forever. Is that living word of God? Peter says in first Peter chapter one, that is the imperishable seed. Imperishable. It doesn't die. It's a seed. It could grow. That makes you born again, makes you alive. And then he quotes, Peter quotes this passage from Isaiah 40. All flesh is grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. This word, Peter says, that Isaiah says will stand forever is the good news that was preached to you. That's what Peter says. The word that stands forever that Isaiah is talking about is the good news. It's the gospel. It's the gospel, the word of Christ, the good news that Jesus has come. The word of God incarnate who became flesh and lived with us, revealing his glory. His glory, the heaviness, the weightiness of the Lord. That he's come, he's received from the Lord's hand. He received from the Lord's hand double For not his sins, because he didn't have any, but for our sins, so that our warfare is over and our iniquity is pardoned. That gospel is the living word of God that stands forever, that never fades in the hot winds of time. What does God say to you if you're looking out over your life? And you see devastation coming. Maybe you can't quite see it yet. But you know it's out there. It's over the horizon. Decline and death. You know that all flesh is grass. And so now he cries to you. Speaking to your heart. What does he cry tenderly? Your iniquities are pardoned. Your warfare is over. Hold to the good news that will stand forever. See the glory that Jesus has. Do you hear that tender cry? Are you listening 